Welcome back. Let's keep chugging along. Now we're going to talk about some mixed defects. Um, transposition of the great vessels, transesoteriosis, um, total anomalous pulmonary venous connection, CAP CC. This is a pretty rare defect, so I'm not even going to really cover it in class. I just wanted you to at least see the acronym and hear the words. And then there's hypoplastic left heart syndrome. Uh, with these mixed defects, uh, sometimes palliative surgery is done first just to buy time for the child to grow for the big uh, corrective surgery. Kind of similar to um, tetralogy of flow, actually. Uh, this condition is also known as transposition of the great arteries. So it can be the great vessels or the great arteries. So what happens here is that the pulmonary artery becomes the outflow vessel for the left ventricle instead of the aorta, and the aorta becomes the outflow for the right ventricle instead of the pulmonary artery. So those two things just switch places. This condition accounts for 10% of all defects. So what you should know about this is that this disease, it is incompatible with life which means babies are going to die, unless it occurs with a PDA, ASD, or VSD. You have to be able to mix some blood until a surgical correction can be made. Because the blood being pumped out to the body is low in oxygen, this is a cyanotic heart defect. All right, so what is the correction? What is the treatment for transposition of the great arteries? Um, prostaglandin to maintain the PDA open because again, if we don't have the PDA open, we are not going to, the baby cannot sustain life. Um, they can do balloon surgery, um, but the surgical repairs usually can be done within the first week of life. It's going to be done ASAT, honestly. Without surgery, survival is impossible. This is a true medical emergency. Uh, long term, you're, the child's looking at future arrhythmias, tricuspid regurgitation, possible right ventricular failure. For truncus arteriosus, you have a single large vessel that empties both ventricles and provides circulation for the pulmonary system and coronary system. This is, there is usually a VSD present as well. This is a cyanotic heart defect um, because the blood mix is going to mix in the right and the left ventricles to the VSD. Thankfully, this is an, an uncommon heart defect. Really only occurs in about 2% of cases. Repair is going to be surgical, um, long-term, no sports, arrhythmias, same kind of same story, different day. All right, hypoplastic left heart syndrome. This is absence or stenosis. Um, of the mitral and aortic valve, which causes an abnormally small left ventricle and a small aortic arch. This is not a common defect, thankfully. Only 1.5% of children are born with this. 45% of that 1.5% will die by age 5, though. So this is kind of a bad deal because it kind of does put, um, it kind of limits the child's lifespan. So as far as treatment goes, if a child is born with a hypoplastic left heart syndrome, usually parents know. This is something that can be detected on a prenatal ultrasound, and parents go through and they can do um, they can do in depth you know fetal echoes and they can take better imaging. And then parents will meet with a geneticist, they can meet with an ethicist, um, and decide if they what they want to do if they want to try and do some palliative surgery or if they just want to enjoy the baby for the time that they have and then just let the baby pass away um, naturally within a few days after birth. And that's the parent's right. Um, that's, that is their right. That's what they have to do. Basically, prostaglandin is going to be given until the parents make up their mind about what they want to do. Um, with the prostaglandin, Again, we're doing that to keep that PDA open. We do not want the PDA to close. Um, and we're not going to give oxygen to this baby either because it's not going to help. Treatment options for hypoplastic left heart syndrome. One is pain repair. 
immediate survival time is three days. Um, step two would be, you know, a, or a second option would be a surgical. It's a three-stage surgery. Survival of the three-stage surgery is pretty low. Even if the child survives surgery, they are likely to have activity intolerance because of a single ventricle, as well as significant cognitive and neurological impairments. Um, or the third option is to, you know, go on a list for a heart transplant. Prognosis for this condition is very, very, very poor. When I worked in the NICU, um, we did get to, I did see this. Um, the parents knew about it prenatally and they had decided they had a plan that they were not going to do anything. They were just going to enjoy the baby for the time that they had for their three to, you know, three for those few days and just allow the baby to pass away because they felt like the chance of surgery and they just didn't want to put the baby through so much. And then the baby was born and he was the cutest little thing I have ever seen. <laughs> he was absolutely flawless and perfect and beautiful. And his hair was just soft, just like that of like a cute, like little baby duck. I mean, he just was the cutest thing ever. And the parents waited um, and they loved on him and they, uh, and they changed their mind. <laughs> when the baby was about 12 hours of age, they changed their mind and they said, I can't, I can't do this. I can't just let him pass away, we have to try. And so then he was um, taken out of the room with mom and dad and brought to the NICU. And from there, he, um, we administered prostaglandin and that's what he, that's what he got until he was um, transferred to another facility. So the whole point of this slide is just to go over um, caring for children with congenital heart disease. Um, these are the things that the nurse would assess and look for in uh, their assessment. Nursing care of children with congenital heart disease um, maintain nutritional status. Small, frequent feeds, high calorie formula. Standard 20 cal formula is not enough for them. They need higher calorie and small amounts, small frequent feeds. Maintain hydration. Babies need frequent rest breaks. You need to cluster your care. You need to allow them to rest as much as possible. So go in there, do all the things you need to do, and then get out and let them rest. Um, that's going to be the best thing for them, rather than going in and disturbing them every, you know, five minutes or something. Monitor for signs and symptoms of congestive heart failure or deteriorating conditions, and then teach the family about antibiotic prophylaxis. Again, also remember that polycythemia increases the risk of clot formation. Prophylaxis for the antibiotic prophylaxis is, of course, for any future, obviously babies don't have dental work, or any invasive procedure to de decrease the risk of endocarditis. Congestive heart failure is a circulatory disorder in which the cardiac output is inadequate to support the body's circulatory and metabolic needs. This can result from congenital heart defects that increase the pulmonary blood flow or obstruct systemic outflow. It can result from problems with the heart contractility and arrhythmias or from pathological conditions that require high cardiac output like anemia, acidosis, or respiratory disease. It can also result from acquired diseases like cardiomyopathy or Kawasaki disease. About 15 to 25% of children with a cardiac defect develop congestive heart failure. The decreased cardiac output leads to a buildup of toxic metabolites and organs, which stimulates vasodilation and hypotension. Hypotension kicks off the renin-angiotensin system and tells the kidneys to hang on to all that water to increase the blood pressure. Then the tachycardia, or enhanced cardiac contractility and hypertrophy, cause the release of catecholamines, which increases the cardiac output and blood pressure. Ultimately, the heart muscle cannot stretch any more to accommodate the increased volume, so the force of the contraction becomes decreased, which leads to pulmonary congestion. Usually one side of the heart will fail, but eventually both sides will fail. And you can read through the clinical manifestations on your own. Again, they're the same as any other thing for cardiac. 
the two objectives in treatment, well, let's treat the cause of the CHS. And two, we can need to maximize the cardiac output and tissue perfusion. We need the heart to work more effect efficiently and effectively to remove the excess fluid. We accomplish this through the use of MEDS, diuretics, DIG, ACE inhibitors, beta blockers. We can also do surgery or cardiac catheterization as well. All right, so your CHS intervention. We're going to monitor vital signs. We're going to report any distress. Why? Because that's worth reporting, right? <laughs> We're going to assess respiratory function. Elevate the head of the bed to maximize oxygenation. Cluster nursing care to minimize um, nap and sleep interruptions. We're going to play quiet games. No strenuous physical activity. You don't want these kids to get really upset. We're going to um, give oxygen as needed. We're going to give DIG and diuretics. We're going to weigh daily, and you may even have to weigh these kiddos every shift. Of course, they're going to be on INO. They will be on a low-sodium diet, including low-sodium formula. And yes, they do make that. Breast milk is naturally low sodium, so it's an obvious choice. You want to limit feeds to 30 minutes. You want to burp frequently to prevent regurgitation. And again, these kids may need high calorie milk. We will gavage feed the baby if they cannot bottle feed or breastfeed um, because they're just too tired. They may want to, but they, they you know try and drink a bottle for maybe five minutes and they're just tuckered out but they still need their food. So we'll just drop a little NG or an OG tube, and then we'll just gavage feed whatever they can, PO feed. And then we're gonna monitor these kids for developmental delay. They're gonna have developmental delay due to activity intolerance. Kids who are, these are kids who are just flat too tired to meet their milestones. It takes a lot of energy to learn how to sit up. It takes a lot of energy to you know, reach and grab for things. It takes a lot of energy to work on crawling takes a lot of energy to try and pull up to a stand and stand and make those leg muscles work. These kids are going to stand in a, you know, like the little jumperoo thing, and they're going to get tired so fast because that takes a lot of energy to make all those muscles work. They don't have the extra oxygen for those muscles to fire. They already have an increased metabolic rate and oxygen rate. They just don't have enough groceries on board to do all these cute little things that babies and, you know, children are supposed to be doing. Giving digoxin. I guarantee you that I'm going to test you on this. And this is a, you know, this is a high risk thing to give um, digoxin. It's also likely that you could encounter a question like this on board. Big thing. Also pay the pulse for a full one minute. Don't be a lazy nurse. I know you're busy, but one minute. You have to go for a full minute. Don't skimp and go six seconds times ten. Don't go 10 seconds times six, and don't go 30 seconds times two. Count it for a full minute. And then you're gonna hold the dose if the pulse is outside the parameters. Watch the therapeutic level, and I have that listed for you on your slide. You can give this with or without food, just be consistent. And if a child has been on this, and then they're admitted to the hospital, guess what? You as a nurse, that's your job to ask the mom, do you give this with food or without food? Tell me about how you give it and you need to follow the same thing that she's doing at home. No over-the-counter meds or herbals without consulting the MD first. Teach parents to keep this med locked away from siblings. Um, because if a sibling got into this and took it, it could kill them. <laughs> it could make them very sick. Um, have parents do a return demonstration to make sure that they are drawing up the correct dosage. If the dosage becomes changed or say the baby is going home on DIG and this is a new medication. Pull up a little med cup, put some water in it, get the little oral syringe out, and have the mom practice drawing up the correct dose. You may need to get a Sharpie and mark on the syringe what the dose is, just to help. Teach parents how to auscultate the heart rate and teach them about signs and symptoms of digoxin toxicity. Those are listed. Vomiting, that is an early sign of toxicity. <laughs> but what else is vomiting a sign of? Mm, a GI upset, babies, you know, eating too much, babies who just spit up, babies who, you know, get tossed around after they eat. So vomiting is not always a sign of toxicity, but it's an early sign of toxicity. Or I should say vomiting is not always a sure sign of DIG toxicity, 
because it can be contributed to other things too. That's what makes it tricky. I wish there was a cardinal, this only happens in digital toxicity, but it isn't. Vomiting is what we have to work with. So we're gonna have to make it work. Watch for anorexia, diarrhea, abdominal pain. How do you know if a baby has abdominal pain? They can't tell you. <laughs> they're gonna cry, they're gonna be fussy, and they're gonna draw their legs up to their belly. That's how you know that they hurt. Fatigue, muscle weakness, or drowsiness. And you can observe all those things in babies even. And then hypokalemia can increase stitch toxicity. So if a child does get sick, then you may have to um, teach the parents that they need to contact the cardiologist who's going to be following this um, digoxin level. They may need to adjust it until the child is well. And I'll let you read through this slide on Kawasaki disease. For Kawasaki disease, there seems to be some sort of a genetic predisposition to this. The child has a response to a trigger. Usually the trigger is an illness. Stage one usually lasts anywhere from one to two weeks. Stage two lasts from two to four weeks. And stage three can last six to eight weeks after it has all begun. So this is a very long drawn out thing. Because uh, coronary artery aneurysm is a risk factor, is a risk fa well as a complication of this, um, the treatment is going to be intravenous immunoglobulin. IVIG needs to be administered within seven to ten days of onset to reduce the risk of aneurysm. Other treatment is high dose aspirin. We don't see a lot of rheumatic fever. Um, in the US, this is a problem usually more in poor countries. Um, and again, it's because ch most children in the US get, for, get treated for their strep um, infection. But it can happen, so that's why we still have to talk about it. All right, so rheumatic fever, um, hallmark signs usually occurs one to three weeks after an untreated group A strep infection, untreated strep growth. Most of the time, kids with strep growth feel so awful that they end up getting treated. <laughs> but in case somebody slips through the cracks, you're looking for a heart murmur, um, chest pain, um, tachycardia, even while sleeping. Two or more joints become inflamed with pain, uh, swelling, tenderness, and heat. And it may migrate from joint to joint. Spontaneous nodules occur, occur over bony prominences, skin rash, possible aimless movements of the extremities or grimacing of the, of the face. Lab-wise, you're looking for an elevated ASO titer or SED rate. The treatment for rheumatic fever, <laughs> antibiotics. We've got to eradicate the strep infection. Aspirin for the anti-inflammatory and anticoagulant action. I think a few times that we actually give children aspirin. It's not very often. If you see us give children aspirin who, um, sometimes if they have cardiac defects, um, but then rheumatic fever and then that Kawasaki disease are about the only times we really ever give kids aspirin. Because you know, most of the time aspirin in children is a no-no. We also give steroids to reduce the inflammation. Long-term prophylaxis, most children with this are gonna recover fully. Um, it is very important to teach parents to complete the full round of antibiotics when you're treating a, a strep infection. And this is why. We don't want parents just to give, you know, three or four days of antibiotics and be like, oh, they're feeling better, we're good. <laughs> because you may have knocked out 80% of the bacteria that were causing the infection, but you had that 20% left, but then when you stop antibiotics early, then that 20% starts to grow and multiply rallies up the troops and you end up with a, another strep infection that may be resistant to the antibiotics that you treated last time or that may develop into rheumatic fever. So again, parents are gonna do what they will. All you guys can do as nurses is just to try. But try and really emphasize always that parents need to complete the full course of antibiotics, always. <laughs> 